What do you have to bring tomorrow? All 74 textbooks. You might need two loads. Hmm? Woo. Sleep tonight. Exactly. Exactly. What? <laughs> and the test will be Friday. I did give you a hint. And so let's go ahead and finish up a little bit of the 80s into the 90s. Finish it all up tomorrow. I'll tell you the Clinton story tomorrow. It's a good story. And maybe a couple other stories if I can think of any. I have lots of stories. Some I remember, some I forget. That's it. Got to give Gabe that. Arg, arg, mateys. Okay, did we get to Afghanistan? Did we get arms? Oh, did we get arms control? Start Gorbachev. Oh, you're, you're not, you still go to school. I know. I decided awesome. to show up. Come here. Oh, thank you. So that was still a little left to go. We finished it on Monday. Cool. Did we get to Afghanistan? Hmm? Yeah, it's on teams. All right, cool. And what else do we need? What else? Do we need arms control? Did we get the start? Yeah. Yeah, that was the actual. So there was arm control. What was the near war? When they almost went to war, what was it called? What was the war scare card? The name, yes. Oh. Able Archer. Yeah, it was a military exercise. Yes, there's an office in the Pentagon that does nothing but look how to come up with clever little names for operations so they have, are more politically acceptable. Before the operations were kind of meaningless or big ones, they, they try to come up with something that's going to be really, really catchy for the TV screen or whatever screen you're watching today. And oh, uh, what was Reagan's economic program called? Era. No, well, it depends on your point of view. Reaganomics, but it was what kind of economics? Conservative trickle down supply side. Yep. And oh, what what happened to defense spending? Went up dramatically. And got really close to nuclear war. And Reagan's reelected. Peace talks. Let's get to Afghanistan then. So we mentioned the Mujahideen before. And remember, Al Qaeda was the base. The United States was arming them through Pakistan, through the Pakistani secret police. I should have Pakistan out of nasty dictatorship at this time, too. So uh, you know, the United States was claiming we're spreading democracy, but we're fighting the Soviets and we're really encouraging some pretty rough characters in Afghanistan. If you read anything about that, it was, yeah, anybody fight the Soviets? And it was also a tribal area, very divided country. The Soviets would eventually be defeated and have to retreat. Obviously, we're going through this very fast. Gorbachev wanted a way out. They actually pulled out and left a puppet government that survived well into the 90s through a civil war. And the thought was it would collapse right away. It did not unlike the government the United States left, when it, when the United States pulled out, it collapsed as the Americans were pulling out. We thought we might have a good month before it collapsed. And the Civil War would rage on for a very long time. The United States basically, once the Soviets left, it would be good luck. And there'll be a lot of resentment, especially in Al-Qaeda, who thought they were going to go there to fight this noble fight to stop the godless communists, and then the United States used them and then left. This resentment will fester down the road. Well, eventually in this civil war, Pakistani secret police, at first American approval, would put in a very theocratic religious group called the Taliban, who would take over Kabul and southern Afghanistan. And eventually they would become very repressive. Um, Creating, trying to create a, a their vision of a Islamic state, and they would shelter Al Qaeda there. So Al Qaeda, Al Qaeda helped them in the civil war that was still going on at this time and still going on today. 
Taliban, who the U.S. would help put in power, would be the ones that the United States would help remove in 2001 and would fight again all the way to 2021 and are now back in power. So that, while this is going on, what was uncovered in 86, there were rumors of it, was one of the biggest political scandals of the Reagan administration. And I should add, Reagan had a lot of scandals. No administration had more members of the administration indicted for crime than the Reagan administration in the history from then all the way up through today. But there are hostages held in Iran, U.S. hostages. And there, the, uh, uh, that's Iran, I'm gonna start Lebanon, in Lebanon. Lebanon was in the middle of the Civil War. They, they've been in the Civil War since 1976. We can blame that on the French. Most of you can blame on the British. This time you can blame it on the French. And allies of the Iranians were holding these hostages. So we saw the Reagan administration run out of the basement of the White House, backed by this guy, Lieutenant Colonel in the Marine Corps, who was stationed in the White House named Oliver North, secretly sold weapons to Iran, which was flagrantly violating a violating series of laws after the hostage crisis. And they did release most of those hostages. Most, some would be more. Uh, one of the hostages was a professor at the American University in Beirut, and his son was, uh, I think someone was a freshman in college, played basketball in Arizona, now the head coach of the Golden State Warriors. Yeah, Steve Kerr. I just find it kind of fascinating how the, these kind of names kind of pop back around in history. Anyways. Then they took the money and they illegally sold it to guerrillas. So this is the legal money that the U.S. was aiding to overthrow the, the government in Nicaragua. They call them counter-revolutionaries or contras. So here's the secret dealings. Here's the hostages. Here are these guerrilla forces, uh, quite a motley crew that made up this force. They would not win, but this flagrantly violated the law. And this was all designed um, for the guise of anti-communism. Well, many laws, over 40 people would be indicted, 11 would be convicted, more would have been convicted, but I'll tell you about what happened in a second. But this went all the way up to the executive branch. But Reagan got off, no charges, even though it was his administration, the executive branch, ran through the executive office, ran through the basement of the White House. Everybody all the way up to the vice president had at least some connections with his secretary of defense was going to be indicted and convicted. What's going to be. But Reagan, in a deposition about this, would say, I don't know or I don't recall over 130 times. Now, either he was lying or he had no idea. There's a very good chance he had. Alzheimer's really starting to ravage. Kept that seat. You could do speeches. And if you still go through each couple of three by five cards where you could read things off of in his hand, but he was fading fast. And so he somehow got off. His popularity did drop. Yeah. Hmm? And he was in my year before. Oh, no, it's not He'd be the oldest president ever, but Biden's going to pass. And then the next president would pardon almost everybody, and that would kind of end the indictments. Whoever is elected in the next election will be the oldest president. I'm assuming they will, but him. I mean, getting old. And uh, including that's the former Secretary of State. They, they so they were they, basically once President Bush gave pardons to everybody, it ended. And so this also showed that Watergate and pardoning Ford did not stop breaking the law. So the election of '88, the Vice President for uh, Bush, I'm sorry for Reagan, George H. Walker Bush. Scion of a very wealthy, scion of a very wealthy family in New England. He moved to Texas to try to uh, make his 
to make his name in oil. He was already a very rich man. He would run for president, and he ran against a very technocratic, uh, kind of drab, but seemingly successful governor of Massachusetts, Michael Dukakis. And everybody that summer thought Dukakis was going to win big. His poll numbers, he's up almost 20% in the poll that summer. And everything reversed. Dukakis was a draft campaigner who ran kind of a silly campaign. The Bush campaign hit him on a few things that really worked. This is the last campaign of the Cold War. There was a lot of talk about Pledge of Allegiance. A lot of, uh, the first one I really noticed where they started wearing flag lapel pins to prove that they were real Americans, which I'm always fascinated by that because if you weren't a real American and tried to undermine the country, wouldn't you put flag lapel pins all over your country to hide yourself? So I'm always kind of questioning that. And there's also some, uh, a lot of racially tinged ads against the caucus um, saying he's stopped on crime, especially crime committed by African Americans. It was a really nasty campaign. And one of the things, too, Bush was considered to be kind of a wimp for various reasons, which was kind of garby. But remember what I told you about campaigns, image. And he did not present himself as the strong, masculine uh, man of Reagan. Reagan play active as a coward. He wasn't, but he play active as one, kind of the Western, lot of things in the cowboy hats. And Bush did. And this is really weird because Reagan, during World War II, you know, filmed propaganda movies, and Bush was a hero. His plane was shot down over a Japanese island, and he was managed to save two of his crew members. He flew a torpedo plane. He was the real deal, at least there. And if the Japanese would have captured him, they were executing all American pilots. And terrible fighting. So, and that, that was the win. That showed y'all image in campaigns really does not mean reality. It doesn't matter if you like his policies or not. It's just kind of amazing to me. That was a big one. I didn't put the map down. Bush came, Bush fell. I was able to win a fairly big victory. But Democrats still control the House and the Senate. The Democratic Party was still incredibly strong in many places, and it hadn't totally died out in the South. Well, Bush had the great advantage of being president when the Cold War ended. So he could claim victory, even though it's not really victory. It's more like the Soviet Union imploded. Gorbachev allowed for elections in Eastern Europe. And once that happened, one by one, the countries around the Iron Curtain pulled away. And that just broke the whole thing out. Finally, East Germany broke away. There were protests in Berlin, marching towards the wall. The East German secret police, the hardliners in charge of East Germany, ordered them to open fire on the protesters. They refused. And once that happened, just this, they just, the guards just dropped their guns and left. They stormed over the wall that night. This is actually just as the sun is going down. He, on November 9th, they took that picture of them going over the wall, and the war just, well, war just ended. Well, then wall coming down. Germany hastily would re um, reunify in 1991. The Soviet Union would survive till 91, and then it would implode. The 15 new countries. And not this spot, this is near the Brandenburg Gate, but my sister-in-law married a Berliner. He was in high school. When this happened, and he went there and climbed up on the wall. He's the one who also used to taunt and throw things at the strip of and stuff. But there's the wall coming down. There's still pieces of the wall left. Now it's basically just kind of this brick imprint of where it was. Uh, it, that was still a day I'll never forget. I, it, it was happening that evening, and I stayed home from school. I was in college. I stayed home to watch it. It was just so startling. I, I could not wrap my mind around the Cold War ending. Just, I couldn't wrap my mind. Around. Well, when I put down, but, but the war is not over. And the focal point of the United States would turn. And there's a lot of effort to try to find a new enemy. Well, in the 1980s, there the first Gulf War it was a horrible, bloody war when Iraq attacked Iran. Iraq was kind of encouraged by the United States, fearful of that Islamic revolution spreading to Iraq. The dictator, anybody know the dictator of Iraq with the U.S. helped put in the power? Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein. And the war started going really badly for Iraq. 
the U.S. tried to help both sides. Remember, that's why the U.S. was selling Iran weapons. That was why. The U.S. and West Germany gave Iraq mustard gas, which they ended up using against their own people to stop a rebellion. This mustard gas would be used as an excuse to go to war against them. This is me doing the I'm pondering the future. Yes. But the war ended a bloody draw. Iraq was devastated. Iran was devastated. Over a million casualties. Well, in 1990, Iraq invaded Kuwait. They, they had claimed Kuwait since Iraq was created by the British in 1919. Iraq had claimed Kuwait. Kuwait was created by the British in 1899. Let's get back to blaming the British for happy with that? Okay. Kuwait, the little uh, nasty little dictatorship in Kuwait, had been increasing oil production, dropping oil prices. Iraq blamed it for that. Iraq thought the United States didn't care. Kuwait was no friend of the United States. We're enemies, but we're no friends. He thought, actually, Saddam Hussein thought that the United States gave the approval to attack. And so they overran Kuwait. Kuwait had no army, but the United States did not give them. And that is going to lead to the second Gulf War, 1991. So this Persian Gulf War would be initiated by the United States originally sending troops to Saudi Arabia. Now, Saudi Arabia, since its creation after World War I, has never allowed foreign troops. Let me rephrase that. Have never allowed non-Muslim foreign troops in Saudi Arabia, ever. And for the most part, in areas around the two most holy spots in the Islamic world, there have never been non-Muslim occupying troops. There might have been advisors like in the Arab Revolt of 1916, but never occupying troops. And so they originally turned down the United States off to the U.S. lives. The U.S. sent the Secretary of Defense, a guy named Dick Cheney, who would become Vice President, and a guy named Colin Powell, the chairman of the Joe Chiefs of Staff. He was Secretary of State when you guys were born. They went to Saudi Arabia and showed satellite footage to the Saudis, the dictatorship there, of Iraqi tanks massed in the desert and say, Iraq's about ready to attack Saudi Arabia. So they panicked and allowed U.S. and then other allied troops to the United States in Saudi Arabia. It was a lot. It was satellite photographs of Iraqi, Iraqi tanks about ready to invade. Eight. But in some areas of that desert, you can't tell the difference at all. So, Saudi Arabia on troops. What are the two most holy spots? Let me phrase that. What's the most holy spot in the Islamic world? Yeah. Mecca. Mecca. And American troops are going to stay for the next uh, 14 years. Now, they didn't occupy Mecca, but they're in Saudi Arabia. Number one reason Al Qaeda Al Qaeda gave attacking the United States, a series of attacks culminating in the September 11, 2001 attack. Number one was American troops for hope. That would be the number one reason. A lot of people said, oh, this, this would be bad. And then after the Gulf War, like, you should leave, leave. So with that, and then in 1991, troops that were fresh from Germany, no longer needed them, literally got on boats, the equipment got on boats in Germany and sailed to Saudi Arabia, over 500,000 American troops. And there were uh, like a British armored division, a French armored division, every country sent troops. Luxembourg sent like a swath. Syria sent troops, and there were no ally in the United States. They counterattacked and quickly pushed the Iraqis back. I should refer to that. They counterattacked by four weeks of heavy bomb. The Iraqi had no Iraqis had no air force, and they just bombed everything about it, destroying most uh, many of their heavy weapons, but also remember total war, electrical electric plants, water treatment plants, sewage treatment plants. So they just made it. The lives of the Iraqi miserable, hoping they would drive on to Saudi Arabia. Have those ever been repaid? 
It's, it's, we're talking back in 1991. That rockets were pushed out. They set the oil wells on fire to try to blind American bombers. Here's an American F-14 fighter. Here's he was on the road to death as Iraqis tried to escape American and British planes just devastated them. So they had no air, no planes. Well, Saddam Hussein, though, remained in power. The United States knew that if we pulled Saddam Hussein out, that would lead to a civil war in Iraq. They did not want that. So they left Saddam Hussein in power. Now, this will be proven absolutely 100% true a decade later. But it kind of humiliated the Americans. Because Saddam Hussein immediately came in and was like, I won! Because he wasn't removed from power. Now, of course, they were destroyed. Their army was never rebuilt. But and but the U.S. put heavy economic sanctions by claiming that the Iraqis were building weapons of mass destruction. And they were. They were trying to build a nuclear program that was completely destroyed after this war. And they found uh, some of the facilities and some of the old mustard gas and a few other uh, gas weapons that the U.S. helped build during the Iran war. So that wasn't totally true. These sanctions would be brutal. It's estimated in the next 13 years, 300,000 Iraqi children would die because of the lack of prenatal and postnatal care. I should add that Saddam Hussein basically pocketed the money and built a lot of really ugly, cheap mansions. He was a brutal dictator. Well, Bush's popularity was really high, and then a nasty recession took hold. And this just shows the GDP growth. It, happened, it started right during the Gulf War, with the big decline in GDP growth. It was not as bad as 1982, certainly not as bad as 2008, when you guys lived through. But it was different. It lasted longer than previous recessions. And so the areas that were hit were hit harder for longer. And this showed a dangerous new trend in economic depression. So this had not happened since the New Deal. It was partially created by the um, different type of economics of the 1980s. And so the election of 92, that depression, that recession was everybody's mind. Now, I put it in one line, and I don't know why, but the Democrats nominated a conservative Democrat by the name of Bill Clinton the governor of Arkansas. Very young man, a pretty brilliant politician. He just had that gift of giving a speech, came from very humble roots. Probably one of them, um, maybe only Andrew Johnson or Jackson, Andrew Jackson, maybe a few of the presidents came from more humble roots than Bill Clinton. The Republicans renominate George Herbert Walker Bush, but he is now tainted by this recession. And a new third party campaign that was only for basically two elections, the Reform Party, a oil billionaire, an oil billionaire by the name of Ross Perot, and here's Perot right here, came in. And his big argument was against these new trade agreements. We'll get to in just a second. And the election would turn out to be a Clinton victory. He won big at the Electoral College, but only won about 43% of the vote. Perot got nearly 20% of the vote. In fact, Perot got uh, almost 30% of the vote in Montana. Almost got 30% of the vote. Now, this map I chose on purpose because of my anger over red state, green, red state, green state, red state, blue state. So the Democrats are red here. The Democrats are red. Remember that red state, blue state thing didn't come about until 2000. I know what your whole life, but it kind of, it just always irritates me because the world is much more complicated than dividing up into two colors. Exactly. It's It's a small fight, and I would argue a few times, but I'm doing it. Oh, okay. I mean, to give you an idea, yeah, sure. but give me an idea about how dumb the dividing things up into red state, blue state. What did I say? I just said one day, one state, two states. <laughs> the red state, blue state, California. Uh, you know, California, that's winner take all. They got all the electoral votes in the last election. Um, that state, as you can imagine, in the last election that you were alive for, 2020. Me too. Uh, 
That's a weird way. I don't know why I said it that way. They gave Joe Biden the most votes of any state in the union. Anybody want to guess what state gave Trump the most votes? Texas? California. Oh, shit. California. The most votes for Trump was in California. The most votes for Biden was in California. But remember, the Electoral College, it's winner take all. Guess what state was the second most votes for Biden? Texas, which went for Trump overwhelmingly. See, it's not a popular vote for president. It's only within individual states. Think about all the votes that aren't counted then. Because we have this system we have now that no other democracy has anything even near as weird as this. Yes. So, how do we yeah, that's it's probably much closer. Yeah. Even state, you know, states are going overwhelming one way or the other. There's still a lot of votes there that are just kind of lost in a national election. So different shades. Yeah, different shades. So just, or just blank. Blah. Okay, moving on. <laughs> this was kind of a democratic win. Republicans have been in power a long time, but these were new Democrats. They actually called themselves new Democrats. And they were neoliberal. Neoliberal saying, instead of government solutions like the New Deal, we can have market solutions. Neoliberal was a European invention. And liberalism in, in Europe, we would call conservative. And so he was a conservative Democrat. And so they were running away from the, the New Deal. That gave the Democrats uh, you know, a lot of electoral support, but now they said it's not working anymore. And so, for example, a big ally, Bill Clinton, in fact, he tried to run for president in 88, so the first time was Joe Biden. He was new. Barack Obama was new. Biden, I don't know what Biden is now. Biden is very much middle, and he just kind of shifts. As the Democratic Party is moving away more towards liberal economics, Biden's kind of moving that way. He's always in the middle. He's middle man. Yeah. So instead of using that government program to like do things like help with education, we we'll try to find things in the free market. I'm trying to like give people money, or I'm sorry, on. Um, yes. Yeah. That's give good. give money to the wealthy and see if they can come up with more ways. Oh yeah. We should still, it's, it's tentacles are in everything. Yeah. Actually, when they was in the New Deal, like, one of the reasons for you talk, like, the, I saw the part of, like, the whole bank regulation, they were working pretty well. So, what's the reason? Well, remember, the 70s was pretty bad. The yeah. They should go up, and that just seemed really weird. But also, part of the thing that people didn't think the New Deal wasn't working well, it still did leave some people behind, but it's still not complete. But the biggie is, people weren't making huge fortunes that they did before the New And they became more politically organized, and gone. And once it was gone, they made the big fortunes. I agree. Like, parents, but the president's kind of like, all the um, like, if this is left, so this is great. They're like, even these kids, but I like saw it where they put in British officials and everybody that's over here is now like way over here like they're more right even like the people on the left that are actually in the middle yeah. are called liberals when there's actual people in like other countries that do actual liberal things that have more support i'm not sure what you're saying i don't know i'm just i find it confusing as to how people are like portrayed, it's like, I mean, I guess it goes back to both the communist thing. But yeah. You know, like, they, like the New Deal would be like in Europe, they would have called it social democracy. So, yeah, it's really confusing. And like, Labour Party in Britain is more closer to what we say, like, so yeah. And the Liberal Party in Britain is actually fairly conservative. The Liberal Party in, in Australia is very conservative to our point of view. Just everyone has different definitions. And that's one thing that's fun with these kind of things. It's all this terminology. You'll find out in life. A lot of life is just knowing the terminology. And if you do, then you can act really smart. So with that, 
It was negotiated during. It was negotiated during the Bush administration, but Clinton was 100% for it because it's a neoliberal. Most Democrats were opposed. It was called NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. And basically what it did is it got rid of tariffs between these three countries. You might have heard of them, Canada, the United States, and Mexico. And the thought was if you get rid of any tariff barriers, so open up the borders per se, and allow for the free transportation of goods and capital, money, back and forth, this would expand American trade. The United States would make American goods could be sold in Canada and Mexico. It would expand industry. It was presented as this boom to the American economy. Ross Perot ran completely against it. And he said there'll be a huge sucking sound of American jobs being sucked into Mexico because the labor there was so much cheaper and they didn't, and they didn't have to enforce environmental laws or any worker safety laws. But um, Clinton said no. But he was neoliberal. He joined Republicans in voting for this. And so this shows a big change from the Democratic Party, at least claiming to be more pro-worker and workers' rights, to we're going to do this free trade agreement that might get rid of jobs. There he is signing it. But once it was signed, it was an immediate effect. The trade deficit went up dramatic. Yeah. That's exactly what he said. That was quoted a big sucking stuff. The trade deficit is the gap between imports and exports. And that means a lot more imports, fewer exports. I mean, we're not making as many manufacturing goods. Hmm? Yeah. So our wealth is flowing out. And so with that, not only that, but the United States had these big corporate farms. The U.S. is really good at producing corn. It makes really good at it. You go to Nebraska, you know what I mean. I mean, that's why high fructose corn syrup is put in everything because they have just too much of this junk. I think those corn chips kind of scary. It's toxic. It's kind of accumulating in the liver. Which is good. You like stuff to accumulate there. You need liver to grow. But Mexico was dominated by small family farms. Cheap American imports went into Mexico and completely and utterly destroyed Mexican agriculture. Their small farmers were gone. And so many of them were desperate and lose everything. And what did a lot of them do? There'd be a massive wave of undocumented immigrants from the United States out of desperation. And you start seeing this, and then a whole new wave of nativists come out in the United States. And it's no coincidence that in northern Mexico, but now it's spread all over because of this, there's going to be a rise in organized crime and gang violence because what else are you going to do? I'm not saying they can't find other things, but I, I'm also have never been that desperate. And a similar free trade agreement is going to happen in Central America, and all of a sudden, what's going to happen in Guatemala and Nicaragua? The same exact thing. And where are many of the migrants who are desperate to try to flee to the United States coming from? These places. And so this, that was, I was when I remember this happened, I was I was opposed. Graduate school, this was one. I knew this was bad. I never. I just. Just was beyond my bigger. It was shocking what happened to this. And would make the poverty in Mexico worse, and it was not exactly a rich country before. The Trump administration would negotiate a new one, a new trade agreement. This is a pretty clever one. Are you ready? Are you ready for this? US, Mexico, Canada agreement. It's actually, in some ways, probably a little bit better. Um, for protecting home industry workers and environmental laws in the country than the pre than NAFTA. We're not going to go into all the details of it. We kept the trade the trade agreements open, but corporations, for example, under NAFTA, could sue a state if the state has a law against dumping toxic waste because they could say you're violating our free trade agreement. A lot of that has been taken away. Yeah, NAFTA was, wow, NAFTA was something. And so a couple more things. 
the Democrats are going to be gutted by NAFTA. Absolutely gutted. Manufacturing jobs begin to decline in union membership. The Democratic Party that slide had already begun with the Southern strategy would be finished off in the South. Why? Textile jobs went south. But then the Midwest, aka the Rust Belt, working class people there who lost their jobs started becoming Republicans. Ohio, Michigan, uh, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Iowa were all reliably Democratic. They're not, they're either not very Republican, like Ohio and Iowa, or battleground states. All after NAFTA. And so here is our closed up factories in Ohio. Ohio is really weird. I would say Ohio is always weird. Think about it. But here is after 2010, but these are all Democratic losses up to 2015 in. Senate, the House, state legislatures, and governors. It's really hit the, de the Democratic Party hard. Because I'm winning against what the Democrats claim to stand for. And the Democrats, I think, are kind of rebounding upon that. But I, you know, it's way, it's, um, it leads to a lot of the confusion of our politics today. Yeah. So, so the UN it's more it's still pretty conservative but it's not as conservative as that how about that and 96 clinton would be a reelected we're not going to talk about that election because that ross pro did jump in there's clinton in the 90s or was let's skip this we're not going to skip we'll come back to it this is very quickly before the bell rings talk about on influence so I didn't put down impeachment, but you can see it in big letters, impeached. I think you can, I didn't need to write this down again, right? Clinton would be the second president impeached. The Republicans were looking for dirt and all over the Clinton administration. They couldn't find anything. There was petty corruption at all politicians and people with power do, you know, get sweetheart deals that aren't necessarily illegal. They're kind of slimy, but they're not illegal. But they couldn't find anything illegal. But in the middle of a deposition about a land deal in Arkansas, that there was nothing that Clinton did wrong on that one, a question has popped into Clinton, are you having an affair with a woman by, with an inch from it, by the name of Monica Lewinsky in the Senate? And that's what the impeachment is. Lying on the deposition is felony. And they impeached him on that. Now, this wasn't what the intent of the founding fathers were. They were worried about political corruption, not affairs. But Republicans saw this as a way to go. For the first time after NAFTA, they took over control of the House. He was impeached on two of the four counts, but he wasn't convicted. Ironically, even though people were kind of disgusted with Clinton's behavior, because it is just slimy having an affair like that in the Congress. And that's slimy. But I know I'm putting my own personal judgment, but my, I, I, my guess is most people would probably agree. And 21 or 20. No, I think she puts in your call, but 22. Let me tell you real fast. What happened to his approval rating? They went up because people were mad. People were mad at this political attack on him. I know, isn't that weird? So tomorrow, It'll be the last thing, 2000, we'll go September 11th, a couple more things. I know, it's really interesting. I remember hearing people say that, that Clinton was a communist. He's like, he just not much to do. So it's like he's still like, I didn't see my face on. Well, you know, they can not bring the attack from making pizza. So, you know, there's extremes. Bring that re review, right? Aaron is in London. Ah, jealous. Thank you. Fun time. No, I don't know. She's having fun, good. Yeah. He I mean, the, the end was pleasantly surprised, but not everything there was stolen. Most of it is, but not all of it. You know, that's the thing about it. 
so awesome to see something like that. Uh -huh. You can see the British Museum. Uh -huh. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Ah, no. Bye. I don't speak French. <laughs> but, uh, so that's sad that it's gone, but I got a chance to see it. Yeah, I still get a chance to see it, so it's pretty cool. She just has a good fun time. She's going to be there for like a month. Yeah. Hey, last day of this stop. Yeah. So I don't know, maybe a half day. I'll, I'll wait to see how long things take. But we'll go back to the library for sure next week.